The following lecture is aimed for dental students, interns, junior trainees, junior residents of oral surgery and oral maxillofacial surgery, as well as junior residents of other dental specialities. I also dedicate this lecture to my fellow colleagues and dental practitioners of several dental specialties all over the world. May you all benefit from it. In memory of my late parents, may the merciful Almighty God rest their souls in heaven and peace. Please allow me to give a brief bio about the speaker. My name is Mohammed El Shulkami. I'm a professor of oral and maxillofacial surgery at the Faculty of Dentistry, Suez Canal University in Ismailia, Egypt. This lovely city, which lies around 120 kilometers to the eastern of the capital Cairo in Egypt. It was named after the late uh, great ruler of Egypt, Khedib Ismail, the one who did the opening ceremonies of the Suez Canal in 1869. I'm also the professor and the supervisor of the oral maxillofacial surgery department at Faculty of Dentistry, Sinai University, Kantara campus in Ismailia. I also worked as a part-time associate professor at MIU University and MSA University for several years. I'm a visiting professor at the Faculty of Dentistry, Beirut Arab University in the oral and maxillofacial surgery department in Beirut, Lebanon. I'm also the managing director of the Egyptian Dental Center, a multi-speciality discipline dental and maxillofacial center based in Cairo, Egypt. The main topic for today, I find it one of the most important topics in the dental practice, is the management of the medically compromised patients. And the main topic of today's lecture is the management of endocrine disorders in the dental practice. Let's have a quick overview about our topics today. We are going to discuss diabetes mellitus, hyperthyroidism, and last but not the least, the adrenal insufficiency. Let's start with diabetes. We are going to discuss the definition, types of diabetes, diagnosis and lab investigations, the pathophysiology, which I find it very important topic to understand what is underlying the diabetes problem, signs and symptoms, and last but not the least, management protocol. Diabetes mellitus by definition is a disorder of carbohydrate metabolism, which is characterized by the impaired ability of the body, either to produce or respond to insulin, and thereby they cannot maintain proper levels of glucose in the blood. The name diabetes mellitus refers to the symptoms of such condition. The word diabetes comes from the Greek word diabenin, which means to pass through, and this describes the copious urination or passing of large amounts of water in the urine. And the word mellitus is coming from the Latin, which means sweetened with honey, and this refers to spilling of the sugar in the urine. Diagnosis and lab investigations. Obviously, in addition to the clinical signs and symptoms of diabetes, we need to confirm this by further lab investigations. If the patient has two fasting glucose levels rising above 140 mg per deciliter, it is considered diabetic. If the patient also has two hour postprandial glucose levels, rising greater than 200 mg per deciliter, and that's to say postprandial means it is after measured uh, two hours after 75 gram ingestion of oral glucose. Furthermore, the presence of diabetic ketoacidosis, and last but not the least, the HbA1c, or the glycated hemoglobin test. And this test gives an idea about the glucose level in the blood within the past three months. The HbA1c test relies on the fact that whenever the glucose level rises in the blood, there is some sort of conjugation between glucose and the hemoglobin found in the red blood cells. And the percentage of conjugated or, or saturated cells with glucose rises and, or is directly proportional to the uh, higher level of glucose in the blood. And actually, uh, as we said before, 
it is used to measure the level or, or the control of the glucose level in blood within the past three months and this refers to the lifespan of the red blood cells so to interpret such a test the normal individual the percentage of saturation is below 5.7 and the pre-diabetic uh, patients have 5.7 to 6.4 percent and the diabetics have 6.5 or greater and as long as this percentage rises above 6.5 this means that the diabetic patient is poorly controlled so any test for diagnosis of diabetes requires confirmation with a second measurement unless there are clear signs and symptoms of diabetes and now let's discuss the types of diabetes we have three main types type 1 type 2 and gestational diabetes type 1 diabetes is characterized by failure of the beta cells of islets of Langerhans in the pancreas to produce insulin while in type 2 the body produces insulin but it cannot be used efficiently either because it is ineffective or there is cell resistant or resistant uh, resistance in the receptors of insulin or both of them and gestational diabetes is characterized by high blood sugar levels during pregnancy usually the levels are stabilized and go back down after giving birth and uh, in these females 60 percent probability of suffering from type 2 diabetes afterwards type 1 is also called the insulin dependent diabetes mellitus or juvenile diabetes or childhood diabetes and type 2 is referred to as non-insulin dependent diabetes mellitus or the adult onset diabetes as mentioned before roughly the type 1 is about 10 percent of the cases and gestational diabetes mellitus amounts up to 12 percent and the rest are type 2 diabetes and as we see here the healthy individual produces insulin in a normal fashion and it is it acts on the insulin receptor and allows the body cells to uptake glucose and use it for energy or for storage while in type 1 diabetes there is failure to produce insulin and so glucose is going to accumulate in the blood and in type 2 there is insulin production but as mentioned before it is either ineffective or there is a resistant in the resistance in the insulin receptors and the cells fail to respond to insulin properly and so glucose also accumulates in the blood gestational diabetes happens when a woman without diabetes develops a high blood sugar level during pregnancy and gestational diabetes results in few symptoms however it does increase the risk of preeclampsia depression and requires cesarean section it can occur during pregnancy because of insulin resistance or reduced production of insulin these are the predisposing factors and risk factors also include overweight previously having gestational diabetes or a family history of type 2 diabetes so let's know some uh, fast facts about type 1 diabetes it can be triggered by any virus including a common cold the type 1 diabetes affects about 1.6 million people in the US most uh, people with type 1 diabetes are children and young adolescents people with type 1 diabetes require insulin as a treatment protocol on the other hand type 2 diabetes there is more than one in every 10 adults with such type it amounts for 90 to 95 percent of diabetics exercise and weight loss are crucial to reduce the risk of pre-diabetics to becoming type 2 diabetics by 58 percent and over 25 percent of adults over 65 years of age have type 2 diabetes And so to sum it up, the age group for type 1 diabetes are young children and adolescents below 40 years of age, while on the other hand, type 2 diabetes occurs mostly in adults uh, above 40 years of age. The treatment protocols for both includes healthy eating and meal planning, 
that it is crucial for type 2 diabetes to control the weight and to decrease, and this leads to decrease of the insulin resistance, increased physical activity, blood sugar regular checks, and last but not the least, ins insulin injections are mandatory and crucial for the type 1 diabetics. On the other hand, oral hypoglycemics are only sufficient to control the glucose levels in type 2 diabetes, but sometimes insulin injections may be needed if the oral hypoglycemics are not able to control the glucose levels properly. To wrap it up, diabetic patients need to follow some guidelines and measures to control their disease and enhance their quality of living. First of all, monitor and lower the blood pressure and cholesterol. Manage the body weight and body mass index. The patient needs to follow an exercise course, about 30 minutes of activity per day, five days a week, total of 150 minutes per week. This helps to lower the risk of developing type 2 diabetes by 58%. Quit smoking, of course, and last but not the least, eat a healthy diet, including less fats, more fiber and whole grain, veggies, fruits, and land meat. This has been proposed by the American Diabetes Association. And let's have a quick overview of different types of insulin used to treat type 1 diabetes and occasionally type 2 also. We have the fast acting, regular, and simulant. The intermediate or a little bit delayed acting, MPH or LENT, and the long acting uh, ultra LENT. And now we come to the pathophysiology. And I think understanding the pathophysiology of diabetes is very important to be able to deal with it. But first of all, let's uh, know some important facts. As we said, the normal glucose level for a patient fasting overnight is the mean about uh, 90 milligram per 100 milliliter or per deciliter and the range is from 78 to 115 milligram per deciliter whereas the normal results for the two hour postprandial test for the non-diabetics it should be less than 140 milligram per deciliter and for diabetics it should be less than 180 milligram per deciliter and please remember this number 180 milligram deciliter is the renal threshold which uh, be able to hold glucose and not let it pass through the urine and if the blood level or the glucose level rises above 180 milligram per deciliter we will have what we call glycosuria which is passing of the glucose in the urine and this denotes that the diabetic case is uncontrolled while uh, uh, a very important number we have to remember always is the minimum level for uh, optimum brain function is 50 milligram per deciliter and we have to bear in mind always that the glucose is the only fuel used and utilized by the brain. So having a lower effect than 50 milligram per deciliter will uh, let the patient go into a hypoglycemic coma. And it is fatal, by the way. Insulin is produced by the beta cells of the islets of Langerhans from the pancreas. And insulin has a diversity of functions. But we are interested in this lecture about the metabolism of protein and lipids and glucose or carbohydrates in general. The insulin half-life is 3 to 10 minutes and it plays an important role as men previously mentioned in the uh, metabolism of carbohydrates, lipids and proteins. It induces uptake of glucose by all the body cells to utilize it for energy production and it also uh, let the liver uptake glucose and store it in the form of glycogen and it enhances the uptake of fatty acids and amino acids by the adipose tissue and muscle tissue and accordingly we find that uh, insulin plays an important role in the homeostatic maintenance of normal blood glucose levels. But it does, it does not play this role all by itself. There is another help from uh, another 
hormone called glucagon which is produced by the alpha cells of the islets of Langer hands of the pancreas so let's shift to the left hand side to the red arrow uh, the stimulus when glucose is absorbed after a meal there is a rise of glucose levels in the blood and this stimulates the beta cells uh, of the pancreas to produce insulin the insulin will stimulate all the body cells and the muscle tissue to uptake glucose and use it as an energy source or convert it into glycogen furthermore the liver also is stimulated by glucose uh, by, by insulin to uptake glucose and convert it into glycogen so accordingly the blood glucose level will fall and if we have between meals the blood glucose levels uh, fall below normal this will stimulate the alpha cells to produce glucagon and the glucagon will go to the liver and give it an order to convert the stored glycogen into glucose to maintain the blood glucose level to rise again so the insulin has effect on different types of body cells the muscle tissue and adipose tissue are affected by insulin and in the absence of insulin they will not be able to uptake glucose and use it as a source of energy the muscles and adipose tissues are going to use other sources of energy like the triglycerides and the fats and the liver will not be able to uptake insulin and convert it into glycogen but on the other hand it will going to convert the glycogen into glucose and let it free in the blood to adjust the glucose level while the brain and nerve cells are not relying totally on insulin they can perform their function but be aware that in the case of diabetic patients if we have a blood sugar level or blood glucose level less than 50 milligram per deciliter the brain will not function properly and I'm always trying to keep it as simple as much as I can And now let's go to the main theme what has been discussed before with the normal homeostatic effect of insulin to maintain optimum blood glucose levels so this is happens in the normal individual and now let's imagine that this normal patient is going in a fasting state what happens when a normal individual goes in a fasting state when any person does not have any food intake there will not be insulin secretion from the beta cells of islets of Langer hands and there is a little bit depression in the glucose levels in the blood and this will stimulate glucagon production from the alpha cells and will stimulate glycogenolysis in the liver to yield glucose and stimulate gluconeogenesis which is yielding glucose from proteins a breakdown of proteins and amino acids furthermore there is breakdown of triglycerides into fatty acids in the adipose tissue and the muscle tissue and hence the insulin is regarded as the body's fat signal so when you don't feed there is no insulin production and if you find insulin production this means that the patient has taken his meal and now let's discuss what happens after a diabetic patient eats a meal we of course know that the diabetic patient of type 1 cannot produce insulin or of type 2 produces insulin but it is ineffective or there is high resistance to it so what happens after the diabetic patient eats a meal in absence of insulin the fasting state of the normal individual will prevail what does this mean we are going to have glycogenolysis in the liver yielding glucose and furthermore gluconeogenesis to yield glucose also adipose and muscle tissue as we said are going to break down triglycerides into fatty acids and triglycerides are going to yield ketone bodies which will furthermore lead to diabetic ketoacidosis the rise in the diabetic ketoacidosis can lead to decreased cardiac contractility decreased response of the arteriols to catecholamines metabolic acidosis which leads to hyperventilation and last but not the least if it is uncontrolled it will lead to hyperglycemic or diabetic coma 
and to wrap it up in simple and plain words the diabetic patient has a good appetite and he goes for his meals regularly but the body doesn't read that he eats because as we said the insulin is the body's fat signal and in presence of hypoinsulinism we're going to have the glucose blocked from entering the body cells and it rises in the blood leading to hyperglycemia and the body cells in turn are going to degrade proteins to make glucose through gluconeogenesis and increase fatty acid oxidation to utilize energy which will produce keto bodies and lead to ketosis and on the other hand there is decreasing glycolysis and glycogenesis and the liver will follow also and uh, produce glucose from glycogenolysis breakdown of glycogen into glucose and so hyperglycemia will exceed the renal threshold which is on 180 milligram per deciliter leading to glycosuria glycosuria which is mean passing of the glucose in the urine and the glucose osmotic pressure will be going to attract more water in the urine leading to increase in the volume of the urine which is called polyuria <coughs> this furthermore will lead to patients dehydration and stimulation of fluid intake which we call it polydipsia on the other hand the ketosis will lead to acetonuria and acidosis and finally if this condition is untreated it will lead to hyperglycemic uh, coma or di ketoacidosis or diabetic ketoacidosis coma and this will might lead to death so we can sum up the signs and symptoms based on what we said in the pathophysiology the patient will feel fatigue or feeling constantly tired there is some sort of altered mental status some signs like agitation unexplained irritability inattention confusion and lethargy furthermore glycosuria will lead to polyuria which is followed by high fluid intake to avoid dehydration and we call it polydipsia and as we said before the patient has a good appetite and hunger and excessive eating which we call it polyphagia however the patient goes regularly for his meals and has a good appetite and hunger but there is severe weight loss for the following reasons polyuria and spilling of high volumes of water in the urine following the glucose glycogen breakdown in muscles and liver to produce glucose breakdown of triglycerides in muscles and adipose tissue to produce energy and gluconeogenesis which is breakdown of the amino acids to produce glucose uh, also leads to breakdown in the muscle mass and decrease in the muscle mass what are the potential problems and risks associated with diabetes first of all we have microangiopathy which is thickening of the intimate layer of blood vessels leading to narrowing of the blood vessel and uh, microvascular uh, lack of microvascular supply and poor blood supply and this of course will be reflected in the poor wound healing we have poor wound healing in the diabetic patients and if you want to discuss infection we have to clarify some important points the well-controlled diabetic patients are no more liable to infection rather than the normal individuals however should this infection develop or happen the diabetic patient will not be able to contain such infection and this is attributed to impairment in the leukocytic function and the chemotaxis signals and proper functioning of leukocytes to face such infection and so the diabetic patients when got infected should be treated aggressively and the poorly controlled diabetics should not undergo any dental procedures or dental surgeries on the other hand, if the patient presents with infection, maxillofacial infection, it should be admitted to hospital to have emergency and proper control of the condition. And also the impairment uh, in leukocytic function affects the wound healing as well because we know uh, that macrophages and leukocytes produce several cytokines and growth factors which helps in uh, wound healing. We also have periodontal health deterioration and sometimes this is the alerting sign that may alert the operator to let the patient have uh, lab investigations to rule out diabetes uh, mellitus. 
So periodontal health deterioration should be prevented by having a proper good oral hygiene program and prophylaxis and maintenance every three to six months. We have also peripheral neuritis, and this is a very severe and dangerous situation because peripheral neuritis with microangiopathy might play a role uh, when uh, the foot is injured and the injury is overlooked by the patient as he doesn't feel uh, his, 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 his extremities well like the normal individual and this might lead to diabetic foot which uh, may need furthermore uh, amputation afterwards. We also have retinopathy which is one of the most important and dangerous complications and if it is overlooked or not treated or not guarded against, it might lead to blindness. And last but not the least, we have the diabetic coma. What are the types of diabetic coma? We have three types, two associated with hyperglycemia and one associated with hypoglycemia. The diabetic ketoacidosis hyperglycemic coma, this is associated with the type 1 uh, diabetes and diabetic hyperosmolar hyperglycemic coma this is associated with type 2 diabetes it also have some sort of altered consciousness and last but not the least and the most important and the most lethal and fatal and dangerous is the hypoglycemic coma and here is a simple comparison between the diabetic hyperglycemic coma and the hypoglycemic coma Regarding the cause, this is co caused by severe uncontrolled diabetes mellitus. On the other hand, the hyper hypoglycemic coma is uh, caused by insulin overdose and lack of uh, food intake. You can have odor of acetone in the hypoglycemic coma, which is absent in the hypoglycemic coma. The respiratory rate, we have hyperventilation due to acidosis in the hypoglycemic coma, while on the hypoglycemic coma it is normal. When we have a uh, check pul uh, pulse check, we are going to have rapid and weak pulse in the hyperglycemic coma. The patient is dehydrated, while on the other hand, it is rapid and strong because increased sympathetic activity in the hypoglycemic coma. The skin is dry due to dehydration in the hyperglycemic coma, and it is sweating in the hypoglycemic coma. The blood glucose, of course, is very high in the hyperglycemic one, and it is very low in the hypoglycemic one. There is urine uh, glucose of course in the hyperglycemic coma which is absent in the hypoglycemic case and urine acetone also is present in the hyperglycemic coma and absent in the hypoglycemic coma and anyway when you have a patient facing uh, some problems or altered consciousness on the dental chair and it's a diabetic patient you should assume or react as if it is a hypoglycemic coma and as we are going to discuss later in this lecture we are going to be very cautious against developing of such uh, type of coma on the dental chair. And now let's discuss the management protocol. We have general guidelines applied for both types of uh, diabetes, type 1 and type 2. Always consult the physician and defer any surgeries until the diabetes is controlled. Don't treat uncontrolled cases. The appointment is usually set in the early morning and avoid lengthy appointments. Use the anxiety reduction protocol, but avoid deep sedation in outpatients, especially in type 1 diabetes. The pulse, respiration rate and blood pressure should be monitored during the perioperative period before and during and after the surgery. Always maintain verbal contact with the patient during surgery. And as previously mentioned, if any altered consciousness or losing consciousness is going to happen on the dental chair, we are going to assume that this is a hypoglycemic one and we are going to act and treat it as a hypoglycemic coma because the hypoglycemic coma is a fatal one. As we said, glucose is the only fuel utilized by the brain and in a few minutes, if the brain doesn't have a good supply of glucose, there might be uh, fatal uh, consequences and death may happen. So we always 
use uh, uh, measures to avoid this or to treat it as a hypoglycemic coma rather than a hyperglycemic one. So we give uh, oral uh, sugar, uh, we give something uh, sweet, or we give uh, IV uh, or, or IM dextrose. Always use the glucometer to monitor the blood glucose preoperatively and maybe also in, in intraoperatively and postoperatively and encourage the patient to have one. The patient should always have one like that and to monitor his glucose levels after the surgery. What are the factors governing the management protocol in general? First of all, the nature of the procedure itself. Second, the length of the procedure. And third, the ability to have meal before the procedure. Last but not the least, the ability to receive meal soon after the surgery and resume the usual physical effort. <coughs> we always have a balance between, or we're always trying to have a balance between the insulin and oral hypoglycemics and the normal meal intake and the normal physical uh, effort of the patient and both of which act to have an optimum blood glucose level. So we have to guard this balance carefully. Let's start with the insulin dependent diabetes mellitus or type 1 diabetes mellitus. Actually we have four scenarios to deal with, two under local anesthesia and two under general anesthesia. Let's start with the local anesthesia scenarios. We have, first of all, the simple procedures, which is uncomplicated dental extractions or other dental uh, work like endodontic treatment or restorative treatment. Here, there is no physiologic or emotional stress on the patient, although we are going to apply the stress reduction protocol anyway, as previously mentioned. And there is no interference with the patient appetite either before the surgery or after the surgery, the patient will have ability to eat and uh, perform his general activity. So there is no need to modify the insulin dose. The patient is told to have his regular meal in the morning, regular breakfast, and take his regular insulin dose. Now let's come to the other scenario or the second local anesthetic scenario. When we have surgical, more invasive surgical procedures lasting for about an hour or a little bit less, like removal of impacted wisdom teeth or impacted canines or insertion of several dental implants, we tell the patient to take his normal meal as usual and take the usual morning dose of regular insulin. However, he should take only half the dose of the MPH insulin. And under any circumstances, if the patient will not be able to eat temporarily, postoperatively, the MPH insulin should be totally omitted. He should not take the MPH insulin in the morning if he is not be able to eat temporarily after surgery. Let's go to the third scenario, which is under general anesthesia, ambulatory surgery, which is a relatively short procedure, but done under general anesthesia or uh, sedation. The patient should be uh, admitted and hospitalized, and he will be told to miss the morning meal. And as long as the patient is going to miss the morning meal, all insulin doses, whether regular or MPH, should be omitted in this morning. And half the insulin dose should be given once the IV axis is established in the OR, along with 5% dextrose IV in a water drip at a rate of 150 milliliter per hour. And always the anesthetist will be watching the signs of hypoglycemia, such as tachycardia, and the patient is encouraged to eat within three hours postoperatively. And always we'll have to the glucometer intraoperatively in the OR and the anesthetist every now and then should check the uh, glucose level and accordingly adjust the insulin dose or the dextrose supply. And last but not the least, coming to the fourth scenario, which is performing major surgeries requiring longer duration under general anesthesia. Here the patient 
will not be able to have a normal dietary intake uh, soon after the surgery or perform his physical activity uh, regularly after the surgery. More or less, the protocol, the same protocol will be followed. The patient will miss the morning meal and all insulin doses regular MPH should be omitted. Half the insulin dose will be given once the IV axis is established in the OR along with 5% intravenous dextrose. And the anesthetist will be uh, always watching the signs of hypoglycemia like tachycardia and doing a regular checks uh, uh, using the glucometer for the blood glucose levels. The short term rise in glucose levels or hyperglycemia will not harm the patient much. So it is advisable when performing uh, oral surgery under local anesthesia or general anesthesia to err on the hyperglycemic side rather than to go for the hypoglycemic side as we said before that the hypoglycemia is fatal. So the insulin should be adjusted to keep the plasma glucose level at uh, levels between 150 and 250 milligram per deciliter until the patient resumes his normal dietary habits and activity levels. And accordingly in major surgeries if the patient will not receive usual caloric supply and will maybe be hospitalized for a couple of days, the insulin should be given based on periodic uh, every six hours plasma glucose sampling using the glucometer and the uh, dextrose and the uh, insulin should be adjusting accordingly. Management of the type 2 diabetes or the non-insulin uh, dependent diabetes mellitus and the local anesthesia are going to tell the patient have your regular meal and receive the usual oral hypoglycemic dose and the uh, protocol will follow as previously mentioned we are going to put an early morning appointment and use the stress reduction protocol as follows when major surgeries or uh, ambulatory uh, oral surgeries are done under general anesthesia the patient will miss his morning meal and will not take any uh, oral hypoglycemic uh, drugs and accordingly we are going to use the insulin supplementation in the intra and post-operative periods to control the uh, blood glucose level along with the dextrose until the patient resumes his uh, normal dietary habits and normal physical activity. Now let's come to hyperthyroidism. We are going to discuss its pathophysiology, signs and symptoms, potential risks, and last but not the least, the management protocol. Let's start with the pathophysiology. The hyperthyroidism is characterized by increase in circulating T3 and T4. T3 is about 100 to 200 nanograms per deciliter which equals to 0 0.1, 0 0.2 micrograms per deciliter. Whereas the normal range of T4 or the thyroxine is 5 to 13.5 micrograms per deciliter. Both of them are increased in Graves' disease, or uh, which is the multinodular goiter, or thyroid adenoma. What are the signs and symptoms of thyrotoxicosis? We have fine brittle hair, hyperpigmentation of the skin, the patient suffers from excessive sweating and uh, heat intolerance, He's, he always feels it is, it, it is hot, the, the weather is hot, weight loss, remarkable weight loss, the patient suffers from tachycardia and palpitations, which is feeling of the, the, the heart beats, restlessness and emotional liability, and sometimes in some cases there is exophthalmus, however it is not pathognomonic. This is the uh, eye bulge of the exophthalmus and it is attributed to increase in the uh, retroorbital fat, the position of retroorbital fat. And we can note here that the, there is a bulge in the neck of the thyroid gland. What potential risk do we have here? Please bear in mind if this is the only thyroid problem that can lead to a crisis. The surgical stress can lead to what we call thyroid crisis, and of course, we don't want to let this happen. What about the management protocol? 
the physician should be consulted before doing any procedures. Atropine should be prevented, and uh, some authors recommend that adrenaline should not be given or uh, limited in its dose. I would recommend uh, that you should not use adrenaline. Adrenaline can provoke uh, a thyroid crisis, or if we need urgently a, a vasoconstrictor, we can use something alternative or weaker than adrenaline. Stress reduction protocol is mandatory in such case. Defer elective surgery until hormonal levels are controlled. In case of emergency surgery, we can use beta sympathetic antagonists as well as uh, intravenous sodium iodide to block the hormone release. And the patient should be hospitalized, of course. Any unnecessary palpation of the gland should be avoided because it can provoke a crisis as well. Infections should be treated aggressively and the case should not be treated when infection is, is when there is acute infection. Uh, infections can lead to a crisis, so sh should be treated aggressively. And now let's come to the adrenal insufficiency patient. We have several issues here. We are going to talk about the pathophysiology and the management protocol. Let's have a brief introduction first of all. The average daily cortisol secretion in adults is about 15 to 17 milligram, and the range is between 8 and 28 milligrams. Or we can say roughly it is about 20 milligram per day to make it easier. The secretion of the cortisone follows a diurnal pattern, which has a peak and has a, a fall into low level. The peak is at 3 to 4 a.m. and the lowest levels of the secretion is about 8 to 9 p.m. Cortisone is secreted by the cortex of the suprarenal gland located over the kidneys, while the medulla secretes the catecholamines, epinephrine and norepinephrine. And as long as the suprarenal gland is functioning properly, it's going to produce the day-to-day need of cortisone which is about 20 milligrams and to face stress it's going to produce more far huge amounts let's understand the mechanism of cortisone secretion or availability in a normal adrenal cortex and a normal patient under normal circumstances how does this happen when there is low level of cortisone there is stimulation to the anterior pituitary gland and upon such stimulation or feedback it's going to produce adrenocorticotropic hormone or ACTH and in turn the ACTH is going to pass to the adrenal cortex and stimulate it to produce the endogenous cortisone which is about 20 milligrams daily for the day-to-day -day use and utilization of cortisone and then the cortisol level is going to give a feedback to the anterior pituitary gland to stop secreting the ACTH. This is in normal circumstances and a normal adrenal cortex. However, when such a person faces a stressful situation, the stress will give an order to the higher brain centers, then to the hypothalamus, release of what we call the corticotropin releasing factor. The corticotropin releasing factor is going to give an order to the anterior pituitary, which in turn is going to release the ACTH, passing to the adrenal cortex stimulation, giving in an order of a stressful situation, and accordingly it will react and release about 100 to 200 milligrams to face such stressful situation. It's about a huge amount, 5 to 10 times the normal daily secretion and in turn this will uh, go to the anterior pituitary gland and tell it we have a good amount of cortisone so stop uh, secreting ACTH anymore. In this cases if the patient needs corticosteroid therapy for any anti-inflammatory disease or autoimmune disease and the patient takes more than the normal daily secretion of the suprarenal gland, after two weeks or more, this will lead to 
uh, stopping uh, the secretion of the ACTH from the anterior pituitary gland and there is no stimulation to the adrenal cortex anymore afterwards the, this would be followed by uh, atrophy of the suprarenal gl uh, gland or a weakness of the suprarenal gland and it will not be able to produce uh, cortisone properly so when the gland is not able to uh, produce cortisone properly to face stressful situation in such case we have a potential risk when we face surgical stress we might have what we call the adrenal crisis so how can we manage such a situation actually it's very simple usually minor procedures require no modifications however if we are going to go for uh, more invasive procedures like a traumatic episode or phlegmatic surgeries or removal of several impacted teeth in one setting we might need to do some modifications for patients who are uh, currently on corticosteroid therapy we need to double the current dose the day before surgery and the day of the surgery and the day after surgery and we tell the patient afterwards to return to his normal dose the stress reduction protocol should be followed carefully and thoroughly and in cases that the patient has stopped uh, corticosteroid therapy within the past year we should consider him as a liability for adrenal crisis and apply the rule of twos as well which says if the patient had received more than 20 milligrams daily of cortisone for more than two weeks within the past year he is considered a liability for adrenal crisis and accordingly we should give him a guarding dose which is 60 milligram of hydrocortisone or equivalent the day before surgery and another dose on the day of surgery or we can give him an initial or shooting dose just before the surgery 60 to 100 milligram of hydrocortisone intramuscularly or intravenous before the surgery and this dose should be tapered the days after surgery the following couple of days we should give him 40 milligrams and then we resort to 20 milligrams for three days afterwards and then after six days we cease to give him corticosteroids if we go to the OR under general anesthesia and the procedure is a little bit lengthy we can repeat the initial shooting dose every six to eight hours and then as said be as mentioned before we can taper this uh, dose over the next five to seven days that's to say we, we, we do a gradual withdrawal and the anesthesiologist should always monitor the patient's blood pressure and guard against any unexpected or unexplained hypotension because this might be a sign of developing adrenal crisis and finally I would like to thank you all for your kind attention thank you so much